little business stuff at the beginning. And we're now official since we just started recording. So I'll, I'll go ahead and put our cover slide up here. Welcome to the Alternative Voting Methods Statewide Task Force for the League of Women Voters of Colorado. And uh, if you, if it's easy for you to do, go ahead and put your uh, city or your league initials in your name, renaming it, but it's not necessary. Here's our agenda for today. And uh, if anybody sees something else they wanna add, now's a good time to speak up. We're pretty flexible, so you can add something yeah. later. And I don't think everybody's here yet anyway, so. Um, Neil is gonna go first. He was at a conference with the Election Verification Network in the last month. And so he's gonna, and you, there was a panel on auditing multi-winner ranked voting elections. Um, we're particularly interested in proportional ranked voting, proportional voting period. Um, and that'll be the second item on the agenda about proportional representation, a study group for it. Uh, third, we're continuing our discussion about citizens initiatives on voting methods. This is winding up. There's gonna be a marathon title board meeting on Wednesday, it will probably go to Thursday. There, It may not even have any of the voting methods on Wednesday, given the agenda as I saw it. Um, we'll give a little update on the primary election reform study. And if there's anything else people want to discuss, we'll do that too. Okay, I see. Okay. Um, So here's our voting methods position. We don't read it word for word, but we put it up every meeting so you can read it at your leisure. There's a link to all of the slides from previous meetings, but basically we support voting methods that are better than plurality. And not all voting methods out there are better than plurality, but um, there are many that are. And then we also like to emphasize that there's a difference between single winner contests or elections and multi-winner contests. And uh, Neil's uh, influences here in the post-election analysis section of the voting methods position. So um, the when you signed in for this meeting, you signed uh, basically our meeting norms. So we're dedicated to a harassment-free environment. We want to have productive dialogue, and the League speaks with one voice based on our positions reached through member consensus. And in order to speak on behalf of the League, you must have agreement of the League leadership. Uh, here are our little draft minutes or whatever from the last meeting. Um, anybody who was here last time and wants to speak to any of this, go for it. Otherwise, we can just move on. If you see a mistake, please let me know. Um, and uh, all of our past meetings, videos, and slide decks are on our task force uh, website, except for one where the speaker asked not to have the video on there. Um, and there's how you get to our Alternative Voting Methods Task Force webpage. So, um, I'm going to stop sharing so that we can do some introductions and see everybody. I expected a few more people here by this point, but hopefully they'll all show up. I thought, um, did Beth, Beth, I thought you said Chris was in here. Chris Baum? No, I saw him registered. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Beth put the agenda for the title board <laughs> in the chat. Well, it's I also pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to go multiple days. Okay. Um, Pat, you do a great job leading the introductions whenever you turn on your microphone. <laughs> That's always helpful. 
Beth, since you're with us, I don't know for very long or, or not, why don't you tell us who you are? Hello, I'm Beth Hendricks. I'm the executive director of the State League here in Colorado. Uh, my local league membership is with the Denver League. Uh, thank you all for being here. Great. Peggy Nerland, how about you? Uh, Peggy Nerland, and I'm in Montrose, Colorado, and a brand new member. Great. Montrose, kind of close to my old stopping grounds of Denison. All right. Peggy, Candace. would you tell us your, your background a little bit? Yeah, there you go. Um, I was the clerk and recorder for San Miguel County um, back in, I'm trying to remember the years, but I retired in 2009. So, um, and I had the, the good fortune to bring it into the 21st century. And so was very, obviously very involved with the elections, um, recording and motor vehicles. But you That's moved fine. out of, you moved out of the county in 2013, you said? 2014, and we moved to the front range, yeah. And so okay. we ju we just moved back to uh, the Western Slope two years ago. Okay. So right. the, one of the reasons this is of particular interest is that Telluride is in San Miguel County, and they ran three cycles of instant runoff voting elections, uh, the single winner ranked choice voting form. So, um, but you didn't oversee that, but you were... You you observed it one cycle. I did. I observed. I think it was like you said. I think it was two thousand eleven, mm -hmm. and I did. Okay, watch it. Well, it's terrific having the experience of a of a clerk, uh, to be part of this group. Oh, thank Candace, you. Candice, tell us a little bit about your stuff. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I uh, have lived in Colorado for about 15 years now. We settled here after a long 32 years in the Air Force. And I became involved in um, election, election integrity matters through um, my role as the Canvas Board member for El Paso County representing uh, the Republican Party. So we met Celeste at the title boards where we are involved uh, sponsoring three or four uh, uh, initiatives right now. And we've learned a lot from her and she was gracious enough to invite me to join you all. Thank you. That's super, welcome. Mary. Will Linda be joining us too or does she have a conflict? She's up in Boulder. I really don't know. She, I know she's um, on deadline for some uh, some reviews that are going through the Supreme Court right now. So she has right. to do all those. They're just okay. very, very lengthy uh, documents. Okay. So I, I would be surprised if she comes on. It'll be just okay. me. I'll Go probably ahead. mute out and turn off my camera, but I am listening. Thank you for very much for including me. Feel free to ask questions. Neil is the risk limiting audit expert and I know Linda Yes, I remember Neil. I remember Neil from previous meetings. Yeah. Yeah, I remember you, Candace. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Great. Go ahead, Mary. Um hi, Mary Carher. I live in Loveland. I'm part of the Larimer League. Um my background is um 25 years as the executive director of Project Self Sufficiency, a program for single parent families in Larimer County. And then I was at CSU for a while in the social work department. Um, I think I first became kind of tuned in to ranked choice voting when, when I started to see some election outcomes that could have been very different if a different method had been in place, um, particularly the Loveland City Council a few years back. It was pretty clear that the outcomes would have been different. And then when Fort Collins started implementing their ranked uh, choice voting and the voters approved it and that begins I believe next year you know it, it becomes more local here for us to see how that evolves and so I like being part of this group to just learn about all the different ways that um, voting can happen it's not just one method that's possible or uh, worthy of study there's many different methods and i it takes a while to learn them and i really appreciate the opportunity to continue learning 
Super. Jen? Uh, hi, I'm Jen Cleland. I'm in the Boulder County League, and along with Celeste, I co-lead the voting methods team in the Boulder County League. Uh, I'm all, I've am i been in the league since about fall of 2020, so not that long, but a little while now. Uh, I am also a math professor at CU Boulder, and I work on mathematical analysis of redistricting and gerrymandering. Okay, Neil. Hi, Neil McBurnett in Boulder. I've uh, been active in voting method reform since the 1990s. Uh, active in election integrity and auditing since 2002. Active with this uh, Boulder uh, voting methods team since, uh, I, I forget, 2017 or something. And uh, was appointed to the Bipartisan Election Advisory Commission of the Secretary of State in Colorado last, back in uh, June last year. Great. As the league, as the League of Women Voters uh, representative. Yeah. Gary McMurtry. Hi, I'm uh, near Durango, Colorado. Uh, I'm not a member of the league. I'm just interested in this subject and appreciate the opportunity to learn more about it. Good. Della Clark. Hi. Uh, yeah, you all sound uh, way beyond me. I'm just an IT person and I'm actually still monitoring a project. I'm still working at the moment. So I, I'm just interested in the subject as well. And I want to see what I could do. And where are you from, Della? Uh, Colorado Springs. I'm in Pikes Peak. Okay. Barb Winery. Welcome, Barb. Chat to uh, each other. IT. <laughs> uh, Barb Winery. I'm from Greeley Weld County. Legal and Voters also on the state board as co-director of voter services. Interested in all things voting. So okay. I've not, I've always dipped my toe in the water. I'm still learning about all the alternative methods, but Lots of possibilities and like to keep up with what's going on in this area. Good. Uh, before we get to Celeste, who obviously is last but very not least, I'm mm -hmm. Pat Venturo. I'm also on the Boulder County League's voting methods team and um, learning does not stop. Okay, Celeste. Uh, hi, everybody. I have been involved with the Boulder County League of Women Voters voting methods team since its inception. Um, and I have learned a heck of a lot and I continue to learn. And these days I'm feeling a little frustrated with getting things to happen <laughs> and dealing with politics. <laughs> but okay, um, there may be other people who join as we come along. Um, I want to say that Barb was involved in a lawsuit against Weld County for their um, the way they were drawing their district lines or didn't do the process to draw their district lines. And and you've now uh, succeeded in that. That was a successful lawsuit and they're going to have to redo the process. Right, Barb? Uh, that is correct. We had summary judgment in our favor that they needed to follow state law. Uh, they had a home rule law that they thought was the only law they needed to follow or the only criteria, which was drawing lines by population. But anyway, we have a state law in place that says you need to use the same criteria as we do for our uh, congressional legislative districts. Um, so we've won summary judgment, but we're still trying to get the commissioners to move and, and uh, follow up on that. So stay tuned. Well, she was at one time. And we have Chris Baum who just arrived. Do you want to introduce yourself? Well, I'm Chris Baum, and I am the uh, approval voting candidate for uh, now it's uh, Congressional District 8, uh, U.S. Congressional District 8. And Which I've been working on uh, approval voting for about three years, I guess. 
And reminding everybody, Congressional District 8 was very close in the last election. There were three candidates that got uh, the vast majority of votes. And um, if you could have had approval voting, then maybe somebody would have gotten a majority, but nobody got a majority uh, because they, they, it's choose one voting, whereas approval voting lets you vote for more than one candidate if you want to support more than one candidate. Tony, we're doing introductions. Do you want to say who you are? Somebody has a TV on, it sounds like, or. I'm going to oh. mute myself because my Thank wife's you. talking in the background. Okay. If I can find the mute button, there we are. I'm. Tony Larson, Denver League, and I have been working with Celeste on the initiative that's being proposed. Um, that's it for now. Tony, there are many initiatives. <laughs> You're selling a short. Well, the initiative that we're working on now. The one that, that we're studying at this particular moment is 188, which is a Kent Theory initiative. Right. Right. Um, right. But um, Candice Stutzriam is on this phone call, this uh, meeting, and she is a proponent for uh, 201, which is a prohibit RCV one. So we should um, give everybody their time and uh, and we'll have a good discussion. Okay. And I have a board meeting at six o'clock. <laughs> okay, good to know. Um, okay. So Neil put uh, some comments in the chat. Neil, do you need to, can you share your screen? You're, you're next up, basically. Okay, I will share my screen. Oh, wait, you're not next up. You're almost next up. Let me go next. So we just did introductions. Here's some ongoing news and events. Um, the U.S. Fair Representation Act was just reintroduced this session and it elects it would elect United States representatives to Congress in multi-member districts using proportional representation, which we abbreviate as PR. Um, I was very sad that Joe Negus is no longer a co-sponsor. I think this is probably because he is now in House leadership and maybe he can't sponsor any bill he wants to he has to be aligned with whatever the house leadership is sponsoring so another comment about the fra is that it removed independent redistricting commissions but and i think that was to make the bill more manageable maybe i'm not sure um redistricting commissions and this is straight from the expert jen clellan are less necessary with proportional representation because it's it's hard to gerrymander when you have a multi-member district. My understanding is that there's also a separate bill that has been introduced to require independent redistricting commissions. Yeah, maybe that was the strategy to to a two-pronged approach. So, um, Jen, you want to mention you want to say anything about the Colorado Voting Rights Act? Uh, there isn't really any anything much to say. The last meeting for that group was about a month ago, and it was actually kind of an uneventful meeting. Uh, one thing that's peripherally related is that today or yesterday or something, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear a case challenging Washington State's state-level VRA, so that's actually encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, and may I chime in on the Colorado VRA? Sure. Uh, the League of Women Voters and Colorado Common Cause are uh, kind of taking the lead on that. And uh, basically between the two groups, we're figuring out how to try to raise some money so that we can hire a public affairs firm to actually, uh, you know, kind of take this over the finish line. Um, and I kind of want it in the Constitution and right now the focus is statutory, uh, so that's still a discussion. But it seems to me the VRA should be in the Constitution. I but agree. That's a whole different ball of wax. So uh, that's where we are. 
And then uh, the last thing on this slide is PR 101 webinar, which happens every month, except for two months in the summer. And it's actually happening in the next 10 minutes, it's starting. So uh, if you feel like you need to go to it, you should, but I hope otherwise you could go to it next month and stay at this meeting. <laughs> okay, um, the next meeting date is uh, scheduled for May 20th, um, which is a very busy weekend for league members because uh, May 17th and 18th, we uh, have our state annual meeting. So um, if you're going to all those things, it's a busy weekend. Um, and we'll we'll see what we end up talking about. We always have possible meeting topics. That's not a problem. Okay, we're ready for Neil. You want to uh, go ahead and share your screen? Right. And we also have Barbara Kelly here. I'm glad you could make it. I think this is what I want. So let's see if I think it works. Do you see? And I, I think this has been a problem in other meetings I've had with Neil. His yeah, microphone I, is right. very soft. So you might want to blast your microphone. I can. Everybody else. My way back to the Zoom screen. Oh, man. It is just, Zoom does not know how to do this very well. Let me see. Uh, I can mute, but while I'm sharing, I can't change my sound settings. As far as I can see. So is this loud enough or not? You're pretty you quiet, but it's yeah. okay. Okay. Um, and do you see my whole screen? No. No. Uh, I... Why don't you stop sharing and start over? Well, okay. Let me stop that. Let me go to the mic sessions. Let me. And Barbara, um, you're now. Barbara. Well, while you uh, do that work, I'm going to talk for a minute, Neil, if that's okay. Barbara, you're from Broomfield area, right? Yes. And uh, today we had a discussion in the league about a mem about a bill that two of your state legislators are sponsoring, um, which would change the way the RTD board is elected. And in fact, it would include instant runoff voting. Um, but it, right now they're each person in the in the RTD district can elect their one member, but this would go, this would have only five elected members instead of the current 15, but everybody would get to vote on every member, um, which which cuts down on representation on the one hand but increases each voters say it's a, it's an interesting bill um it would also um appoint two voting members so, so well, maybe we'll, I, go ahead maybe uh, the the league lobbyists are going to end up taking a position on it probably amend but we'll see it's William could, Lindstedt and Faith Wayne, Winter are the sponsors. Both of whom are, are good people. Could you send me a copy of what you're talking about so I could see it? I'll put the link in the chat for the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are you ready? Do you hear me? Yes. So, and do you see the full screen now? Yes. Great. Everything, everything's good by me. I can hear you great. Great, thank you. So um, I'm gonna just excerpt some slides from a presentation that's related to what we wanna talk about here. So 
the main goal that I'm going to talk about is how to audit uh, voting methods which achieve proportional representation. And that is part of what I'm calling the frontiers of election verification. And a month or two ago, I told Celeste we were going to get all sorts of experts together to talk about this in the uh, uh, District of Columbia at a meeting of the Election Verification Network. And that happened. And so now I have all those results. And that's what I'll uh, share with you, the parts relating to proportional representation here. So, Neil, as, yeah. Can people interrupt and ask questions as you go at along? Any time. Please interrupt okay. at any time. OK. Make it interactive. So um, in particular, Vanessa Teague, whose name is listed here, is one of the two worldwide experts in how to audit a uh, single transferable vote, which is a ranked uh, voting method. It's one of many things that are called ranked choice voting. And it's the only version of ranked choice voting that does achieve proportional representation. So that's of great interest to us. And I'm gonna talk about a couple others. So hopefully my screen will be a little bit slow and moving, but Vanessa is in uh, Australia and now uh, left a wonderful university professor job and is now a, a member of Democracy Developers. And she also helped and continues to help the state of Colorado and the uh, county of Boulder in auditing our instant runoff elections, which is another form of ranked uh, voting. And that we can do, but auditing single transferable vote uh, proportionally is a big problem. So I will skip by a couple things here, uh, except to note that yeah, in general, we discussed uh, other topics like signature verification and the chain of custody of the paper ballots and uh, some very cool work on uh, logic and accuracy testing uh, and being more transparent. So just a, a small snippet of what we talked about at that uh, conference. So um, I'm going to skip a couple of these. And actually, I'm going to briefly touch on this because it's also very active work in Colorado. Uh, Carly Coppice is the uh, county clerk in Weld County, Colorado. And Jimmy Flanagan is uh, an expert in the Dominion voting system in Denver. And I just last Friday got some crucial example data from Jimmy that allows me to do this work, which is or to help the counties do this work, which is just very briefly um, to help um, um, to help audit the chain of custody of the paper ballots by sharing very early with the public, like uh, the day after they're scanned, uh, hashes of images of the ballots, which you can then check later without knowing anything about the ballot images themselves, but you can, the clerks can essentially uh, verify that they, that, uh, you know, put a, uh, I, I need to come up with a good way to describe this, but um, commit to the image of a paper ballot weeks before anybody's able to actually see the paper ballot and thereby confirm that nothing changed in the meantime on that paper ballot. I'm not gonna talk about that more here, but I uh, put the link to this paper and you can come talk to me uh, afterwards if you wanna know more. Um, but it does involve some very strange things uh, in the way that, I mean, just awkward things in the way that the images are maintained. So what I'm mainly gonna talk about is just a slide or two here about proportional representation. As you all know, um, hopefully, proportional representation uh, generally, although not necessarily, involves multi-winner districts. 
Um, and uh, some method is used to ensure that the overall set of um, council members or legislator member, legislative members or whatever, mirrors uh, what the electorate looks like. Uh, so that minorities get their appropriate minority share and majorities get just their appropriate majority share, et cetera. And we and all Neil, like that. yeah. It it's I like to think of it as the results mirror the way the electorate votes, not necessarily the racial makeup, but how the electorate votes, right? Isn't that what proportional representation should be? Uh, should indeed, and in particular, voting. that means that it it can represent how they would vote on whatever the big issue of the day is. So if that's a geographical issue, we can make sure that people on both sides of the tracks get their say in, in how things work. If it's a, an issue of uh, renters' right versus landlords, we can make sure that everybody gets proportionally represented. You know, whatever the main thing driving the public debate is, we can ensure that um, the things that people care about uh, have a voice in the decision-making body. Good point. Because there are other methods of achieving some sort of diversity, but they don't have the same really wonderful property of focusing on what it is that people care about. And it's certainly better than any form of districting representation by geography because that really just kind of accidentally and for unfortunate reasons reflects um, what people care about. Most democracies in the world use it. We all support it. There are many methods that do it. In particular, as I mentioned, single transferable vote is a multi-winner ranking system. There's another one called proportional approval voting, and there's a link here to the Wikipedia page on that, which I will uh, focus on as a, a method that we really can do great auditing with. And there's a method of uh, using star ballots. Uh, uh, star stands for score, then automatic runoff, S-T-A-R. And they have a method using those ballots that achieves proportional representation. Um, so there are a lot of ways to do it. A lot of people have this impression that since, um, you know, that only a couple of ways uh, can do it. Uh, there are actually other methods that I'm going to mention somewhere else, I think, uh, that in that are the way most of the world does it, using um, uh, parliamentary methods in which you vote for numbers of delegates in open lists or closed lists and so on that also have very simple ballots. Those we actually know how to do proportional representation for and auditing for, but they're not common or popular anywhere in the uh, US or Canada, so we don't pay as much attention to how to audit those. Uh, one general point that I will make about auditing proportional representation is that because there are so many possible sets of winners, it could in many methods be any mixture of the set of candidates um, that means that there's more ways of winning. And so the margins between all those different ways of winning are just statistically smaller. You know, the top two possible ways of winning might just differ by a couple candidates and they might have really only a minor effect on how proportional they look to the electorate. And the, the principle of risk limiting auditing, which is what we use in Colorado, is um, that you, you spend more effort auditing um, a contest that has a close outcome where the margin is small than you do with a contest that really it was, uh, you know, at least the declared result had a very wide margin. If there's a wide margin, you don't have to gather much evidence to confirm that uh, a particular candidate won. But if the margin is small, you have to do a lot more work. And because margins are small with uh, most forms of proportional representation, there is going to be more auditing involved. 
I think that's a wonderful trade-off because uh, once again, you get a much better result kind of by definition with proportional representation, but uh, it's something to think about it. And that's, that's why I'm bringing this whole topic up. So how should we audit the various uh, proportional representation methods? That's kind of the general question. The method that we have the best results for um, is called proportional approval voting. And that suits me just fine because I love proportional approval voting. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Proportional approval voting has a single, very simple ballot. It's just like the ballots that we use for any council race already. Um, you just vote up or down on each candidate, which basically means you can vote for more than one. And you can vote for as many as you want. If you want to vote for everybody but one, that's basically a vote against the person that you really don't want to be represented on council. But um, you get to choose. And so it doesn't take any more real estate on the ballot. It's, it's not the grid that you uh, see if you're looking at one of these ranked methods where you have to uh, have every possible ranking for every possible candidate. And uh, and so the ballot is very simple to work with, and the rules are very simple. It's it's almost impossible to spoil your ballot because you can vote for any set of candidates you want. And uh, the way it works, I think, is actually remarkably simple. It it's uh, it, it it takes a lot of effort to do, but we can use computers to do that so long as we audit the results. So that isn't the problem. You basically look at every possible set of winners. You know, if there's um, four candidates and two possible winners, then there's six possible ways to have uh, two people um, picked from those six to end up being the winners. And you just look at all six possibilities. And for each of those possibilities, you look at all the ballots. And you basically say, how happy is everybody uh, as represented by their ballot with this particular outcome. If somebody gets two people that they voted for, you assume they're awfully happy. If they don't get anybody that they voted for, you assume they're pretty unhappy. If they get one, you assume that they're somewhat happy. They're probably not twice as happy if they get two than if they get one. They're probably like, we, we, we say formally, one and a half times as happy. But you basically just look at how satisfied everybody is with the result. And you pick the result that has the highest satisfaction among all the, all the uh, candidates, uh, all the voters, rather. And um, the nice thing about this method, then, is that the way that uh, tabulation method works, uh, auditing it is very straightforward. You can do a risk-limiting audit. And um, and you can figure out exactly how much work you have to do, which, uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, it's that's actually not easy for either of the other two methods that we're going to look at. But you can figure that out, and then you can decide how much work to do. Um, one thing that I want to point out, though, as I mentioned before, again, is that because there are so many possible sets of outcomes, the margin might be very, very close. And I, I just imagine that people are not going to want to uh, verify by hand that every ballot looks exactly like the computer interpreted it, just because they haven't been willing to. I would be fine with that. I'm quite happy to do a hand count. This is an easy thing to do a hand count of. But um, <coughs> um, uh, if you don't want to put in that much effort, then another thing that you can do is basically guarantee that the set of winners that that were announced is really good, you know, that people are really satisfied with that. And to demonstrate that nobody has any evidence that there's any other set of winners that uh, that would have done that would have been scored higher. And so you can basically have an audit, even if you don't want to do a full risk limiting audit, you can do an audit that uh, demonstrates that the result is um, very representative 
uh, certainly rep more representative than the plurality at large methods that we're already using. So it, it seems to me that you can pretty straightforwardly demonstrate that uh, things are working out better. Any questions on proportional approval voting and or the auditing that I've talked about? I, I have online code for how to tally it and it's it's straightforward. And I can talk about any of those things, but um, any questions on that? Do people need a short introduction to risk limiting audits? Basically the, um, the goal uh, in a risk limiting audit is to limit the risk that we got the wrong outcome, that the wrong people were elected. And in order to do that, um, we look at pieces of paper and we compare in Colorado, we have a very efficient method of doing risk limiting audits because for every piece of paper in the state of Colorado, for every ballot sheet in the state of Colorado, we have a cast vote record. We have a, uh, a record of how the computer system, voting system, interpreted that particular piece of paper. And so at the time that we do the audit, we can randomly choose a set of ballots, look at the paper, interpret the paper again with human eyes doing all the interpretation, and then compare what those humans um, thought the, the ballot looked like with the ballot of record, the interpretation of record from the voting system. And if there's any discrepancy, we can, first of all, figure out exactly what went wrong by knowing exactly which ballot had a problem and also know exactly how that uh, problem would impact the results and whether uh, we need to, you know, whether we have enough evidence that we got the right set of uh, winners or whether we need to continue auditing or maybe do a full hand count. So a risk limiting audit is a, an audit of the paper to confirm the outcome of the election, of, of a particular contest. And it's it's each contest one by one. So you want to audit all the different contests. And I've um, we don't do that in Colorado. We should. We don't do that anywhere in the world that I know of. We should. Um, I've talked at length here and elsewhere about um, ways to improve Colorado's uh, approaches and, and approaches elsewhere around the country, but um, happy to answer any other questions about that if you like. And if not, um, and you can come up with questions later if you want, I, I will just note that there is another um, proportional voting method. It's called uh, proportional star voting. It's formally called allocated score. Um, I don't know of anyone who has looked in detail at how to get a risk limiting audit of that or really, you know, what, what forms of auditing make sense. My, you know, I hope that it's easier than, um, Single transferable vote, my my guess is that it is, but that's a pretty uninformed guess. So do you all know anything about that? Or if you're interested, let me know. Um, and as you saw, this is the link that I put in the um in the chat. So now I'm gonna go to a different. Are you now seeing my Auditing proportional representation voting methods slide. Yes. Good. So um, I, this is just an overview of some of the other um, voting methods that we care about. Uh, one of them that actually for many years was uh, challenging was instant runoff voting closely related to single transferable vote. And for a long time, this was hard. And you might be puzzled as to why it's hard. The reason it's hard is not because it's really that hard to look at a piece of paper and see if people follow the rules. I mean, it's more complicated and that is an issue. But the real issue is knowing 
um, what the effect might be of different orders of elimination, because both instant runoff voting and single transferable vote um, eliminate candidates one by one. And if there's 15 candidates and they're running for five different seats, the number of different ways that you could eliminate well, I, I'm I'm going to stick for a moment with instant runoff voting. If if there were 15 candidates for one seat, then there's 14 factorial uh, ways, different orders that you might eliminate those candidates. Um, and 15, 14 factorial so, is an enormous number. It's I I don't know. Celeste might know. It's it's 14 times 13 times 12 uh, times 11, 11 times 10. Uh, Times nine, all the way down to one. I, I don't. I don't think I, that might not be a good example, but I don't think computers can can try all of those cases. It's a really big number, um, and the different orders of elimination change how the votes flow and change what the final margin might be, or even who the final candidates might be, and uh, so you can't even figure out what the margin of victory is without some really sophisticated math. But that has been solved for instant runoff voting. It is a solved problem. Um, and actually it's not too bad. The final margins generally turn out to be the same as the margin of the final round. That wasn't clear for a long time, but uh, we've done that kind of audit in Boulder just last November. We're going to do it statewide as of 2025, thanks to Vanessa and her colleague, Michelle. And uh, so we can audit instant runoff voting, and that's, that's impressive news. Single transferable vote, as studied by the very same people for even a longer period of time, is not a solved problem. We cannot figure out what the margin of victory is for an arbitrary single transferable vote election. And if there's a lot of candidates and uh, several winners, the number of possible scenarios to consider is too large for our computers to even try them all. And again, that might seem surprising to those who imagine that computers can do everything and do it almost uh, instantaneously, but it's that hard a problem. So uh, we can, now do uh, an audit of a single transfer rule of a vote with two winners, I think. It's pretty messy. And I think there might be code to do it. There's certainly theory for how to do it. But if there's three winners, bets are off. In some cases, it might be straightforward, but you don't want to you know, depend on something where sometimes you're going to have to tell people, well, we really don't have any idea. There are some approaches that you can try to take to give the public some confidence in the outcomes, but they're all pretty hit or miss. And this is really one of the biggest issues that I see with adopting single transferable vote or really any, um, well, that's the only proportional method uh, using ranked ballots. And so that's hugely troubling to me. So Neil? Yeah. In places that have used STV for a long time, you know, including other countries, what do they do about election security or assuring the public that, you know, the vote is trustworthy? Well, the main thing I can do is point you to uh, the case of Australia. This is, again, where um, both Vanessa and Michelle live. They've been fighting this battle for a long time, I, I don't know how long, maybe a decade. And they have written to the authorities and they have explained the issues and they have provided free source code and they have provided alternatives and so on. And um, as is the case in most countries around the world, the authorities just don't seem to be very interested. Um, um, Vanessa is the person to ask more details. I can point you to some papers that have all of her input, their input on this. Uh, they've written code to, to do it and so on, you know, to, to, to do some work 
and in some cases to figure out what margins are. Um, but they, uh, my recollection is that they have just not gotten uh, any satisfactory answers from the election officials who, you know, in most places don't want people questioning their work or don't want people pointing out that things are messier than they might seem. <laughs> it's a good question. It's a very good question. I know that uh, Ireland and Scotland also make extensive use of uh, these voting methods. And uh, in in at least some of those elections, the process happens um, by hand, which is particularly challenging for some of these methods. But they use you know relaxed rules on on how to do. They don't have to deal with fractions and so on as much. Although I guess you still have to. I will note that Boulder, Colorado, used to use single transferable vote from 1917 to 1947 to elect the city council in a proportionally representational way. And we used to use hands and and long division and fractions and publish these amazing things in the newspapers and so on. So it's it the calculation it, can be done. They're messy. Neil, it's yeah. notable that Boulder only elected three at a time. Three, yeah. Three members at a time for six year terms, not all nine or not five at a time, just three. <laughs> Very good point. So that made it, you know, somewhat easier. Um, but, um, at it, it, when people are doing the, everything by hand, if you're doing the division and so on by hand, um, the, there is no cybersecurity threat. And one of the biggest things that we worry about is that, um, someone, either a hacker or someone, um, mischievous at the voting vendor, equipment vendor, or someone, an insider threat at the county clerk, or someone could, by just changing a little bit of code or inserting a, a uh, uh, malware somewhere in the chain, could just change the results. And so the more that we use computers, which is rare in other countries, even for some of these methods, more less common for some of these methods, the more we have to do checking. And so we it's taken a long time for really the US and most of the rest of the world to wake up to the need to do uh, really solid and robust auditing of anything that comes out of computers regarded re relating to elections. It's a great question. Have two questions. Yeah. So um, much of what you've said today, uh, I've heard you say before. Uh, you went off to this conference. Did you learn anything new at the conference about uh, auditing multi-winner ranked voting or proportional voting methods? Um, at the conference, I did not, but in preparation for the conference, I dug more into these issues. <clears throat> Vanessa didn't go into great deal in her presentation, which I can I think I can point you to a video of her presentation. But what I can point you to is the slide, the the papers that she has written, which really goes into much more detail on what, if anything, you can do for single transferable vote, which is the biggest kind of outlier. And, and actually, since I talked to you last, I have confirmed what I had expected earlier on that um, we can do good audits of uh, proportional approval voting. But let me, uh, I don't have them staring me in the face, so I will put in the chat some links to some papers on, uh, single transferable vote and both the experience in uh, in Australia and the uh, the methods that are used. <laughs> Sorry, too much Can talk. we get a copy of your slides for um, our files, for our voting method, our task force files? I, I put a link to um, okay. the presentation in the chat. Okay. 
So you're saying I can um, I can download it into the files for the task force. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And I have another question if, but I'm happy to let somebody else go first. Go for it. The question I have is, so you were very much involved with the risk limiting <laughs> audits of plurality elections, setting that up in Colorado. You are not involved in the risk limiting audits so much for instant runoff voting, right? And what's your take on it? Did they, is that a robust audit? Does it, does it follow the risk limiting audit rules? Did they have to fudge things? What, I mean, some people are saying you can't do a risk limiting audit of an instant runoff voting election. So what's the story? Um, I, so Boulder did, um, well, let me, let me put it this way. I haven't looked in great detail at it, but I actually think that what San Francisco has been doing for their uh, single transfer, for their instant runoff vote elections has been uh, pretty good. I know that they publish the cast vote records regularly and often. I think they do it daily. And they're the full cast vote records for each of the um, seats that they do in Serrano voting for, the mayor and I think council seats and so on. Um, and they did, they were the first to pioneer the methods that um, that I've talked about here. Boulder used uh, much of the same software with some refinements and improvements by, again, the same folks, including Philip Stark for the audit last November. Uh, Boulder's audit was less transparent in that they did not share the cast foot records before the audit. I don't know how good San Francisco was in terms of the random selection and whether people could verify ahead of time which ballots would be selected. They might have done that right, but I, it's a good question. I haven't looked in detail. In Boulder, we could not verify the random selection for either the answer runoff election uh, audit or the rest of the state's uh, audits of other contests in recent years. We did do that once in 2017, the first year that I, they were still running code that I was um, partly responsible for, and we got it right to begin with, and then they changed some things for some good reasons and neglected to uh, pay attention to this issue, and I've been frustrated and asking for uh, them to fix that. Um, so, you know, it's still hard to do um, an audit that is fully satisfying to discerning members of the public, but we're still doing better audits in Colorado than anywhere else uh, that I know of on a regular basis. And uh, so we're making progress and not as quickly as some of us would like. So one of the uh, things that will come up in the next agenda item is trying to get proportional representation implemented somehow in Colorado. And the since Colorado is so proud of its risk limiting audits, um, a proportional voting method is harder to audit. And so people are going to resist it using a proportional voting method, county clerks, uh, legislators, um, people like that, people who have some say over whether it ever happens. So this is part of my being unhappy with the political situation at the moment, because I feel like it's, it's a real uphill battle right now, but I have a question. This is Barbara. Who makes the decision on which 
voting method is going to be used? Is it a statewide decision? Is it county? Who makes it? Uh, do our rep are our representatives involved? Or I, so I don't we'll, understand the process. There's a slide coming up that talks answers that question, I think. And if it doesn't answer that question, uh, let's talk about it again. In short, uh, if you are a home rule city or a district that you know gets to do its own rules, and you you can run any election you want to, but if you want the county clerk to coordinate the election for you, do it for you, then you have to use one of the methods that the Secretary of State is set up to use. So. Thank, Are there thank any you, other I questions? Think. <laughs> yeah, uh, <me>. yeah. <laughs> I, I want to respond to Celeste um, to try to, I don't know, thread the needle a little bit. <clears throat> I, I, I agree that there are people who will make auditing, <clears throat> sorry, ma'am, who will make auditing an issue for adoption of specific voting methods. Um, I, I guess that um, that that will be people who just don't really want those voting methods at all. I'm not aware of anyone um, uh, as a public advocate who um, would say, let's not do proportional representation because we can't audit it. What I uh, what I propose and and what other advocates that I know of propose is that the benefits, and I tried to say this before, the benefits of proportional representation outweigh, you know, are, are such that we can do enough auditing to, you know, convince ourselves that we got a better result than we would have with another voting method. Um, that's a pretty imprecise thing to say, and it doesn't satisfy, I'm sure, some people who are focused more on interpreting rules than trying to do the right thing. But I think the benefits of getting the right set of winners and the ability to prove that that set of winners is better than it would have been with other methods makes up for that gap. But you know that may be unsatisfying to to many people. Um, I, Candace, I know that you have concerns about the audits. Are there any questions that you have for Neil, or that uh, I, I, you know, you may think of things that the rest of us haven't thought of? I, I did See. put, by the way, in the chat the link to. <laughs> the general auditing presentation that I made that I think Candace has seen. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I saw your presentation, Neil, but I think overall, I'm concerned that by statute, at least how it is presently, that virtually all other methods of audit have been eliminated other than the rank choice, I'm sorry, the risk limiting audit. So um, that that concerns me in itself, that we're unable to perform a hand count recount. We're, um, it's just that our, we're unable to have a third party audit like was done in Maricopa County after 2020. Um, our hands are tied in so many, you know, by statute as it's written now. Basically the, the risk limiting audit is our last resort. And that disappoints me, I think, in the name of transparency, because there is still a lot of controversy about the sampling, about even the concept and how widely understood it is, even to the clerks who are performing it. They're basically just following the instructions as they're handed down by the SOS. Um, and uh, I think Philip Stark is weighed in on it as well, um, saying that he's disappointed with the with the direction it's taken as applied to elections. So I'm sorry that we have kind of painted ourselves into the corner where RLA is all we have. 
I appreciate that. And and as as you'll see and probably remember from my presentation, there are a bunch of things that I think we're <clears throat> we're not doing well, and, uh, and some of the rule changes have been uh, unhelpful. Um, I I will say that. Um, some of the concern has been, um, the, you know, just uh, wonder and amazement that we could actually get <clears throat> risk limits on some of these contests by auditing a very small number of ballots. So the fact that we have very efficient audits in Colorado um, makes some people worried that we're not doing enough auditing. I'm always a fan of doing more auditing, but as as someone who has at least the smattering of understanding of the statistics, I want to assure people that, you know, it really is amazing what you can do with a small sample in many cases. Um, but the, the issues around what contests are chosen and. Um, uh, that, that's my concern. Site. Only two races. Uh, I, go ahead. One, you know, that, that there's only two races chosen. One is. Yeah statewide and one is local and it's done by the spread um it just it's just not a convincing <laughs> uh yeah. it's just not broad enough and deep enough yeah um, I, I concur to, with to that the and... to the satisfaction of the average voter you know it may be a phd probably like yourself um it is a jazzy thing and it's cool how well it works but we want something that's widely understood so that it can be widely trusted as well. So I would, I think broader and deeper sampling and more races being chosen. And I just, uh, we're all about hand counting, hand counting, um, particularly in the recounts. That's the way the, the statute used to read that we could compare um, paper ballots and uh, I, I think we we lost a great deal of trust and transparency when that was written out of the statute. Yeah, the hand so, counting of recounts went away a long time ago, and I totally agree there. And I agree certainly with the broader and deeper deeper coverage. So thank you so much. Sounds like you two have something you can work on together. <laughs> yeah. Well, Neil really stood out to me. I think that's why I remember him so well. Yeah. Well, Appreciate your yeah, contribution keep, keep to, the, to the discussion. Let's, let's keep um, keep gathering like-minded people to uh, mm -hmm. to get bills in the legislature that that really make sense. I think mm -hmm. you know sometimes there's people fighting still in partisan ways that aren't helpful, but I think there's. Mm -hmm really widespread agreement in the integrity community on um, on good scientific ways to do this. And we should be, you know, continue to put that forward. So I'm going to continue to do that in the Bipartisan Election Advisory Commission. And um, I'm sure there are other places. So, yeah, thank you. And I'll continue to watch you, Neil. <laughs> I mean, talk That's to people, talk to your representatives, <laughs> et cetera. All right. Sounds good well, to me. Um, how about if we move on to the next topic, if we're done here? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I'm going to stop your screen sharing. Yeah. Um, and share my screen. And just as a review, here are some of the types of voting methods that Neil was talking about. So plurality voting, uh, this is the ballot you've all seen. And then um, approval voting, it, you might be electing one person, but you can vote yes on three if you support three, uh, so or or four or I mean, doesn't make sense to support everybody because that doesn't change. That doesn't have any effect on, on the totals, except it makes everybody a little higher in their totals. Um, Star voting is a score ballot where you vote, you give every candidate a score. If you don't give a candidate a score, it's considered a zero. You add up all the points, you see who's got the maximum support. 
And then star voting does one more step with a, a top two runoff. Um, and you don't have to vote again. They just take, like if the top two people are Alba and Bill, uh, this ballot would count one vote for Alba. Oops, I went a little too fast. So um, it's a head-to-head -head runoff. And then uh, I think most people are familiar with the ranked voting ballot where um, the only uh, vote that actually counts as your first choice for the only one that automatically definitively counts as your first choice. If your first choice is eliminated and there's a second round, then uh, your second choice can be counted if that person isn't already eliminated. So, okay, I'm going to um, go way back. Whoa. That was an accident. I did not mean to stop sharing my screen, but I'm going to go to uh, here and see if I can share again. And Betsy from Idaho, former state league of former Colorado state league president has joined us. So welcome. And Idaho has an initiative that is um, wants to institute instant runoff voting with an all candidate primary kind of like the Kent theory initiatives that are in the third bullet point here. So, um, okay, let's talk about either a bill creating a study group on proportional representation or the secretary of state creating a study group on proportional representation. At the last meeting, we talked about a bill that would just enable Colorado to hold proportional representation elections. And that's a big lift. And so we thought, well, we could ask for a study group. And so you might ask, why do we need a study group on proportional representation? This is, Barbara, this is your question. I think this will answer it. Um, you're asking about which voting methods can be used in Colorado. So first, it must be authorized by statute. And then the Secretary of State must promulgate rules to conduct the election. That includes the post-election audit, and they must certify the election software. And most of the counties all use Dominion. There are one or two that hand count and one or two that use clear ballot, including, I believe El Paso uses clear ballot and that's a big county. So we, we're we not hand counting. Uh, we're Dominion, Dominion in El Paso. Oh, you're Dominion. Okay, maybe, I don't, uh, I'm sure Neil knows which county uses clear ballot. Anyway. I, um, so, a question, Celeste. Yes. Different counties could use different voting methods? Yes. If one county wanted to, so if it's authorized by statute and the Secretary of State has promulgated the rules, then yes. Here's the next slide, which shows that there are um, the methods that are authorized by statute. Plurality voting, both the single winner and the multi-winner. I showed both of those ballots. Instant runoff voting is authorized by statute and single transferable vote or STV is authorized by statute. That's the only proportional voting method that's authorized by statute. However, all, the only methods that have secretary of state rules and certification of the software are plurality voting and instant runoff voting. So this means that the Secretary of State could promulgate rules for single transferable vote, but um, they, I, I think they don't believe they're ready to do it. They wanna study how, how to conduct an STV election, how to implement it, and then come up with rules after having thought deep and hard about it. So. One reason to have a study group would be to help the SOS so that they could promulgate rules. May I make a comment? Of course. I, 
I like to think that I'm relatively knowledgeable about this, but my head is swimming. And if I attend these meetings, I try and keep up on this. The regular voter who doesn't attend these meetings and doesn't know about all these, doesn't know what an RLA stands for as opposed to a PR, uh, it's mind boggling. There, if you can't explain, I'm a substitute science teacher. If you can't put things in terms that a third grader could understand, then you have no hope of reaching an average person. In my case, I have no uh, chance of reaching a middle schooler. You've got to simplify, not dumb things down, but simplify them down. All these initials, all these different methods and their advantages and disadvantages, people are going to vote. Um, that's, we hear that feedback a lot, Barbara, it's true. And that's why, like I showed you those ballots earlier so that you could see that filling in the ballot is not that difficult. Um, it's, you know, might even be kind of fun. You get to say more than just pick one candidate. Um, the, the tabulation, the certification, the auditing, those are not things that the uh, the average voter needs to worry about. I mean, some people need to worry about them because uh, we want to be able to justify the results. But um, it's Neil talked about uh, of really liking proportional approval voting. Um, the average voter, I think, would find the tabulation for that a bit of a black box versus single transferable vote. You can show how the votes transfer um, easier than you can with uh, proportional approval voting. So every method has its pros and cons. And the league is really in favor of learning more about them and trying them out. Um, and Littleton right now is interested in approval voting, uh, Superior was asking about single transferable vote. So I think would... having different methods for different counties is, is a losing proposition. This is different methods for different cities. And we did this. A hundred years ago, a lot, you know, multiple cities in Colorado used Buckland voting or the Grand Junction system. Um, call, uh, Boulder used the single transferable vote. Other places just use plurality. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that we might, in Canada, everybody uses the same exact voting machines. They don't even use different, like we have Dominion and Clear Ballot here. There, they don't. I mean, I would be happy to start with just using one voting machine, but um, we're we're pretty individualistic in this country. <laughs> I don't know if that would sell. Uh, I I think I think whatever whatever confusion can be cleared up ahead of time would be in everyone's best interest. I think I this is this is head boggling. Trying so to right now track. right now people have different um you have a ballot and you can sometimes you vote for just one person, sometimes you vote for four people, like in for Boulder City Council. Um, sometimes you elect somebody for a two-year term. Sometimes you elect somebody for a six-year term. You're in you're in one district for your state house. You're in a different district for your state senate. Um, I, you know, one of the things I, I worry about is there's this move to move everything to even years, and then the ballots just get longer. And I would like people to vote every year and maybe even out the amount of work the the title board is overflowing with initiatives because 
in even years, you can only, uh, you can put anything on the ballot. In odd years, statewide, you can only put fiscal matters on the ballot. So, I, you know, I, it's it's mind boggling as it is already. And, but- Indeed. But by having, um, you know, instant runoff voting and single transferable vote are actually the same voting method uh, where it just, the number of winners changes. Um, instant runoff voting is so much simpler because it doesn't have any surplus votes that we don't, we often consider it a, a different voting method. Um, and for instance, because it's simpler, it's it's being used in Colorado now, but single transferable vote is not given given the risk limiting audit issues and things like that. It's the Secretary of State would have to set up a different way to audit single transferable vote. Do we want, I think Neil touched on this, do we want to give up proportionality just so that we can um, always use a risk limiting audit? Um, I'm not in favor of that myself, but. Yeah, I have a couple thoughts too. Um, I, I, I mean, I certainly agree with Barbara that uh, complexity is is a problem, and um, I, you know, at the same time, yeah, I mean, I'm a geek, and and I I enjoy um, interesting problems, and for over twenty years voting methods have been interesting problems in my view. So, you know, it's it's a love-hate relationship for me. But in terms of uh, dealing with the public and dealing with people's confidence, it's it's a huge deal. And I, I absolutely agree. And I just think we have to point out and be honest that that is the nature of human decision-making. It is the nature of human decision-making that how to even agree on the rules and how to check that you got it right is more complex and has more um, things that blow people's mind than you can imagine. People kind of think they understand how ranking works, but they don't. And they're always surprised when they run across something that uh, isn't true that they can't imagine how it could possibly not be true. So I think we're faced with that. And what we have to do is do our best to um, uh, note complexity where it exists, avoid it when we can, et cetera. So I, I do appreciate that. And it's always been a challenge in, in our group because some of many of us kind of enjoy the surprises and the gotchas, uh, but it, we always have to come back to that. In terms of um, the choices that we have, I think that uh, any ranked ballot voting method, just straight up in terms of how do voters mark the ballots, which is really the thing that voters have to understand, um, uh, it's it's got serious problems. There are more bad ways to mark a ballot than good ways, and there are people confused by their ballots, their ranked ballots in every election, and they they vote them in ways that. Uh, invalidate their choice and don't get their message across. So I think that's uh, straight up uh, a problem with any ranked ballot approach. Um, and the way that the round by round elimination works and the surplus transfers and the, all of that, I think that's enormously complicated. I keep being surprised that Celeste doesn't see these simple beauty conceptual nature of proportional approval voting. I think I tried to explain kind of most everything you needed to know in what I talked about today. And Neil. I'm obviously not doing a good job, so I wanna continue to try to do that. But there are fewer steps and fewer aspects to it, and it's really very simple. Neil, um, the, the biggest concern I have is selling it to the public because they can't see the tabulation so easily. Uh, look on Wikipedia. There's a very straightforward, exact tabulation of everything that you need to do. It's okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, 
maybe I'm wrong about teaching it. Okay. Anyway, I, I'd love to work with anybody on how to do that. But what I also want to come back and say, you know, while we want to make it easy for voters or less complex and avoid giving them ways to shoot themselves in the foot, um, I, I do not have an expectation that voters will understand the details of statistics or of legislative interpretations of the Colorado Constitution and many books of laws and auditing and cybersecurity. I mean, uh, we also don't need to understand uh, the the um, airfoil dynamics of airplanes, but we get in airplanes every day. We trust our friends to have paid attention to the experts and the accident statistics and so on. And eventually, with enough work, we get to a point of confidence in some of the most amazingly, I mean, how a hard disk works and flies is astonishingly complex, but people don't have to worry about it because the, the inventors have made it simple enough. So that is our task at the, at the level of trying to give people confidence. And we've heard a number of examples where we're not doing well enough. And that's why several of us are trying to work on that. So um, yeah, simplicity is good and it's hard to achieve in this realm. Okay. Um Barbara, I'm, that may not have been a satisfactory answer, but <laughs> it's it's actually it was quite good. Thank you, Neil. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I you need to keep bringing this up because you, you are absolutely right. And we we geeks love to talk to each other and every time we need to be reminded that if we go too deep, we just lose people. So the next slide is for the general public. What is proportional representation about? Why do we care about it? Why, why do we want to pursue it? It's a solution to problems we have with gerrymandering, problems with our winner-take-all electoral systems, and the pendulum swing of legislative government governance. So when the Republicans are in control, they make a bunch of changes, and then the pendulum swings, and the Democrats get in control, and they make a bunch of changes. Instead of sort of finding a... a good middle area where we can govern more consistently. Um, Colorado, as we've been talking, has been a leader in vote by mail, risk limiting audits, and now independent redistricting commissions. And it would be wonderful if we could also lead on studying and possibly adopting proportional representation. There was a big movement in the early 1900s, the progressive era, to have proportional representation for city councils and the Colorado Municipal League or its equivalent created a, a, a template, a charter template, but we can't adopt those for cities now because um, we the world is different. We use risk limiting audits, for instance. Um, okay, so, um, here are more arguments for why we need a study group. For instance, Colorado was not originally an expert on risk limiting audits, nobody is, but the Secretary of State created a working group to study RLAs. Um, before Colorado authorized instant runoff voting and single transferable vote, the legislature created a task force to study alternative voting methods. They created a report they interviewed lots of people to create that report. Um, and then there was a bill that could pass and there were rules that the Secretary of State could promulgate to run an IRV election. So what we have come to conclude is that Colorado needs to study proportional representation before the SR, the Secretary of State or the legislature will feel comfortable moving forward with proportional representation. So when you hear the legislators talk, they'll often talk about how bad at-large elections are. Well, at-large plurality elections, we would argue, are bad. But that's that doesn't mean all at-large elections are bad. If you use a proportional voting method, you could get a great result a better representation result. So um, it seems to be a question of political will 
we need somebody in authority to either establish a legislative task force or interim committee, um, or the Secretary of State needs to create a working group. Um, we were hopeful that this year's election omnibus bill sponsored by Senate President Steve Fenberg would include creation of a task force or interim committee, but he seems to have rejected that suggestion. He says the Secretary of State and their election and the election attorney that he consults, who is the election attorney for America Votes and for the Colorado Democratic Party, are not in favor of putting a task force in there. And last, have we ever considered uh, reaching out to America Votes, who, uh, if I remember correctly, has a lot of influence in how Colorado works? Um, Jesse Danielson, who is a state senator, I think she used to be head of that, and now she's a state senator. But she um, and and Joan uh, Fitzpatrick, who used to be state. Senate president, uh, maybe the only woman pre state Senate president. Um, she uh, helped reach out to America Votes a year or two ago to ask because they were opposed to some better voting methods bill. Um, but we haven't really gotten concrete answers from them. It seems to be that they don't want to rock the boat very much. They want to work with uh, the county clerks and the county clerks don't necessarily want more work. And that's the impression I get, but it would oh. be great to have somebody else try to reach out to them and see if they can get a better answer. Uh, Maybe by the this... way, I, I wanted to come back to some material you talked about a minute ago. I don't think you need to go to the slides, but... I just wanted to make the point that as you have really been clarifying in a lot of good ways, um, it is difficult to do single transferable vote or any proportional method for a state coordinated or county coordinated election. And coordinated actually means more than just the county running it. It means you know, like with other uh, contests under Title I. Um, I would like to make the point that uh, it has been done in the past. Cities like Telluride and Basalt and so on at least contemplated running instant runoff before we had all these rules, before we knew how to audit instant runoff. People used other voting systems or convinced their county to do it, not under Title I, which has the RLA requirements, but under other titles and so on. So, you know, it it, it still is the case that a city or a county can, that is home rule at least, can choose to do all this stuff and just do it however it wants to, um, either getting a friendly county commissioner, uh, no, county clerk to agree to do it or to count them themselves or to hire an outside I, group. You know, it's, I it's a big lift, but I just want to clarify that. Um, Neil, I don't think a county clerk would run any non-plurality, non-IRV election. Well, I'm, would... I'm just saying that county clerks have done IRV in the past before the state stepped up to it. So which, which in a, ones in a did county it? I that don't know. has a friendly county clerk, no. they can do it. Which ones did it? I don't know a single county clerk that did it. How did Telluride do, do their elections? The Telluride city town clerk did it. Okay, well... The there are cities Town that are the same it. as as cities, like in Broomfield. I, I'm just, I, I, I'm not trying to make it like this is the way we should go. I'm just trying to clarify that it's a little different of how we've done it in the past, and that there is hope in places that have cooperative county clerks or city councils that are willing to jump up to it and and do it themselves. That's all. Uh, Betsy, you had your hand up. Mm -hmm. So my question is, thinking about how to move forward with having a study group, is there a list of why we should 
why we should look into proportional representation, who would benefit, how it would increase the, the public trust in elections. I mean, what are, are there talking points that could be persuasive to political actors that are always trying to figure out what they can get out of any decision? There's a lot of information out there about the advantages of proportional representation, but I don't know. I don't know how this is what we're struggling with. Like, here are some reasons on the slide for why proportional representation is good. We can cite multiple articles and, you know, interviews with people from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where they use proportional representation. But then things happen and it, it becomes a question of political will. Somehow we got risk limiting audits. Somehow we got instant runoff voting, but, and Neil is a big fan of proportional approval voting, but there's not a huge lobby for approval voting, whereas there is a huge lobby for instant runoff voting. There's not that big a lobby for proportional uh, RCV. So uh, it, it, somebody needs to get into power or some people like the Bipartisan Election Advisory Commission need to have a little more power to get the Secretary of State to create a working group. I, I don't, <laughs> did I answer your question, Betsy? <laughs> Not exactly, but you, you tipped out close to it. I'm just thinking if you were sitting down with a key political actor, what would be your three most persuasive selling points for why they should support this? The number one would be better representation. I hear legislators all the time talking about better representation, and they are arguing for single member districts. And but what what is better representation get you? It gets you hopefully a government that is more responsive to the people. And these other two points, you don't have the gerrymandering, so there's a lot less of the politics, maybe less money in government, uh, campaign finance, corruption kind of stuff. You don't have these winner-take-all electoral systems. And you don't, like, one of the reasons we, the League, want to use the popular vote to elect the president is because the winner-take-all system of state-by-state -state electors, presidential electors, is just not fair. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. why, why, why should we do that when we have a perfectly good popular vote system? <laughs> so so um, I, you gave me lots of good selling points just now. Great. Mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to sell this. Sometimes we forget the end goal, but that's that we need to keep that in mind. So mm -hmm. um, Neil is on the Bipartisan Election Advisory Commission, and I don't know if maybe that need maybe having a working group for the Secretary of State on this it needs to be part of the bipartisan election advisory commission's next meetings agenda. But if anybody, I, I, I'm struggling here. This is part of my political disillusionment here. It's easy to just throw up your hands or, or be stonewall, but how do we make positive change is a question. And it's, I'm also cognizant that we're 10 minutes over time. So Neil, you have your hand up. I think we're gonna zoom through the other slides. 
after this, but if anybody has the answer to how do we solve the political will question, speak, please. Neil? Yeah, well, I'm, and I'll just uh, repeat very quickly the notion that I gave before. If we, I mean, the league is powerful, It's it's been heard, but if we can work with common cause, if we can work with um, um, the the organization you talked about before that really has the ear of the Democrats. America votes. America votes. If we so, can work with other groups or find other groups to work with, that's helpful. That's all. So maybe that should be the action item from today's meeting. We should ask them to meet with us for a proportional representation study session. What do people think of that idea? I mean, fair vote should be in that in that group too, right? As well as the um, the uh, RCV for Colorado. Okay, so let's right now. I'm going to stop sharing and let's come up with the names of the people who we need to we should have in this group and let's make this a plan. It's not going to happen this legislative session, but maybe it could happen for the next one. So RCD for Colorado, fair vote. Um, Center for Election Science or yes or no? They work on proportion, they work on approval voting. I think somebody from Equal Vote Coalition would be very interested. They are the star voting folks. Don't, don't forget Common Cause. Common yeah. Cause and America Votes. Yeah. Fair vote. And what other, how about uh, Unite America or whatever? What's oh, it yeah. called? Uh, America Votes. Do we want Vote at Home? I don't think they, um, I, I don't know that they're involved in this stuff. Maybe, if they are, sure. Do we want nonpartisan ref National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers? Yeah, I think they're they're actually uh, located here in in Denver, or that's where their annual meetings are. Anybody else? I mean, we've had um, input from experts in California before that have been successful. Portland. We could get speakers to come from Portland, Oregon, and uh, uh, Albany, California, and you know, folks that have succeeded at the ballot box or or with city initiatives. Cambridge. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like this is creating a task force just among these groups you're you're at you're talking about speakers coming but in terms of the, the members thing, yeah. of this group what did you just say i agreeing with you yeah so for, in terms of the members of this group um rcv for colorado fair vote center for election science equal vote coalition common cause america votes unite america National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers, and then invite speakers from California and Cambridge. I, I would invite um, uh, auditing experts too. So EVN in some sense, or um, Vanessa's group or whoever. How about <clears throat> fix our house? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, tomorrow, I... Jen and I are meeting with Lee Drutman. So uh, we could also run this idea by him. How about Ken? Um, he's, <laughs> he's a big fan of proportional representation. Yes, a side note on that. Um, I looked at the email invitation I got and I didn't immediately see a link for us to meet. So if you have a link for that meeting tomorrow morning, could you send it to me tonight? Yeah, I didn't definitively see that either. So. We should figure that out tonight. I I added that in the note when I responded to the meeting, actually. So okay. Um, 
Okay, well, I, I like coming out of a meeting with a an action item. So I I think this is something, you know, if if the legislators and the Secretary of State are not going to listen to us, and definitely maybe we should invite some legislators and the Secretary of State to be part of this group. Um, we'll just create our own task force. <laughs> And uh, and past and possibly future representatives like uh, Ron, um, uh, just Tupa? Uh, um, Tupa, Ron Tupa, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I see Barbara has to go. Thank you for coming, Barbara. Um, I think you can see my screen again. Um, so. Uh, the only the other two things are just ongoing things we've been talking about a uh, reminder of how you get on the ballot um and then here are some of the things that are happening this week kent theory who's very wealthy is behind about 70 of the 350 filed initiatives um, initiative 188 is like the bare bones alaska final four version and um, the league is taking a hard look at that one to see what we might support or how we feel about that. Um, Candace Stutrium on this call is a proponent on number 201 to prohibit RCV um, and has refiled that one. And so it's going to be heard on Wednesday or Thursday whenever it comes up on the agenda. Um, and Candace, I thought the definition in the new version is much better than it was before. So congratulations on that. And then there's another fellow, Ryan Ross, who's got a, some initiatives, but they have so many things on them. I, I, It's hard for me to believe that they're going to make single subject, which has to happen before it can start collecting signatures. Um, this is an example of what the final four is, and these slides will be on the website. Um, the primary election reform study is mostly done by Marcus, and I will be scheduling weekly meetings so we can, so he doesn't have to work on it all by himself. Um, and I know Idaho and Kentucky and maybe Minnesota would be interested in this. So that's about it. Um, Thank you for staying a little extra over time. Um, I'm going to stop sharing, I guess. Wow, Celeste, as always, a flood of very useful and up-to-date information. An action. We got an action item. And every time we drop our goal, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to a more and more manageable one. Um, yeah. Betsy, do you want to tell us what's happening in Idaho? Uh, well, we're close to the deadline and the month. Uh, but the assumption is he's going to make it. Uh, this is and, a final four also yes. initiative. Yes. And you're collecting signatures oh. for it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. And uh, Della, is there anything you'd like to say or any IT language that we got wrong or anything like that? No, I have no questions. Just listening. Okay. In. Thanks for coming. Just um, to be clear, Betsy, you think that that there's an initiative in Idaho getting a uh, final four on the ballot? Yes, it's. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yes, it will. It should be on the ballot in the fall. The league is going to work hard this summer trying to do community briefings to explain because it's two parts. It's an open primary and then ranked choice voting. Final four. It's an instant runoff only, right? Yeah. I, I'm one of the things I'm I, I don't like is that they only 
call for instant runoff voting in initiative 188. And I wish they would say ranked voting method because then you'd have the option if you were electing more than one person of using the proportional one. So, um, Peggy, is there anything you'd like to add or? <laughs> She's looking for her unmute button. You're still muted. <laughs> Okay, nothing nothing she needs to say, it sounds like. Okay, well, thank you for coming, Peggy. And I hope you come again. Chris, anything yeah, you thank want you. to say? Or? Thank you for a very informative meeting. I, I feel like uh, I reflect the uh, opinions that a lot of this leaves your head swimming. And uh, But I, I think the longer you're exposed to it, the, uh, the more uh, relaxed and at ease you feel with it. And... Uh, the easier it is to talk to other people about it. Uh, one of the things that was really useful to me was uh, uh, the uh, in Independence Institute article on what uh, proportional voting was all about, you know, where Hitler was running versus Jesus versus uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And that really brings it into focus. I wish I could come up with a good illustration of what proportional representation is about, it always hits me that one of the reasons that we have our system of government, where we have a House of Representatives and we have a Senate, was because the Founding Fathers really didn't want proportional representation. They wanted each state to be kind of sovereign. And I would wonder about, I haven't had explained to me why proportional voting wouldn't uh, take away from the power of very uh, sparsely populated counties, say, uh, in, in formulating state policy. Uh, maybe there is a simple explanation. I certainly don't know what it is. Uh, so, the, the, you know, in the history of the founding of the Senate and all this, you know, the, the Senate and the House thing was all a big compromise. It was about small states, big states, slavery, anti-slavery. And I don't think we should be doing anything based on what the founding fathers hammered out as a compromise. And my standard answer to small counties, big counties, land doesn't vote. Counties don't vote. People vote. And people have a right to be counted equally. And I would point out that if if there's an issue that is common among, you know, all a lot of rural people, those rural people, if that's the issue they, they vote in favor of, they will get proportionally represented as people to say, gosh, we should have, I don't know, more rural broadband or more highways or, you know, whatever it is they want, they will get representation. Whereas... Without that, it's right in today's world. the The cities are gonna gonna you know take the get the the votes and run with them. I mean, it's a little different given rural states and and the electoral college and stuff. But um, in terms of just whatever people's interests are, that's exactly what proportional representation will provide you. We have some safeguards because, you know, we do have a majority system generally, but by requiring two thirds votes or 55% vote sometimes, that's a little bit of a protection against just letting a, a bare majority run everything. And so, you know, the filibuster is a way to protect some minorities um, in, this, in the U.S. Senate, and, and we have a few other things you know, the number of, it's really hard to pass a constitutional amendment because you can't just pass it with a bare majority. You have to have, I think it's three quarters, don't you? 38 states. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, Celeste. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Neil, you and I might be working on a plan for, um, for a, task force without 
not run by the Secretary of State and not, let's stop the recording. Why don't we do that? And not run by, can you stop the recording? Uh, let's see, I think I can stop it.